thank you for calling us together this morning that we might worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray that your spirit would bless us with uh, grace and strength, that we would lift up our hearts to you and rest in you and your provision for us. Grant us your blessing this day, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remain standing and we'll confess our faith and make use of the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> Church of the Lord Jesus, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders, hearing it, said, This man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine, and put it on a reed, and 
gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Now finally, Ephesians chapter 2, read the first 10 verses of that. Ephesians chapter 2, page 1242 in the Pew Bible. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, according, or excuse me, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And this will finish our reading of God's word this morning. Let's uh, in unison pray in the words that the Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
2, a well-known portion of Scripture where the Spirit of God comes down upon the church at Pentecost and fills the disciples. They begin speaking in other tongues, and a great crowd gathers around to see what this is all about. And so the Apostle Peter, standing up for the rest of the disciples, uh, takes a moment to explain how what they are seeing, this uh, demonstration of the Spirit's presence, and if you will, this reversal of the confusion of Babel many years ago in the confusion of languages, now we have this uh, expression of, of the, the gospel of God to the nations of the earth, all in their different tongues. Peter says this is in fulfillment of what God had uh, spoken through the prophet Joel, and we won't pick up that portion of the sermon, but we'll uh, begin reading at verse 22 and read through verse 41. Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about Patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are, are witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh Lord, for this marvelous moment in our history when you were pleased to uh, bless your risen Lord Jesus with the Holy Spirit, and he poured out your Spirit upon this earth, poured it out upon your church, 
that we might bear witness to the glories of your great work. We pray, Lord, for the help of your spirit even this day, that we might receive your word in faith, resting in its promises, trusting in its truths, and living by its uh, uh, commands. And we pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in us, that you would sanctify us evermore, and we ask for your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Some of you may have been fans of Monty Python and the British comedy uh, movies that he put out. Uh, I did not watch uh, much of any of them myself, but I was aware of them in high school and a little bit afterwards as some of my friends were watching that. Um, the the, the uh, movies or the comedies were um, examples of a classic British understatement in terms of humor. They would say something in a rather droll manner that uh, you would not, just by the, the manners of the speaker, anticipate a joke, but the, the substance of what they would have to say would be so funny you'd break out laughing. One of the scenes in uh, one of uh, Monty Python's movies, uh, The Meaning of Life, is a, a scene where a bunch of folks are gathered around in a banquet, they're all sitting around the table, and in walks death the black gown and the scythe and uh, sits down at the table and one person says to the other, well that puts a damper on things today. <laughs> and uh, you know, that's the kind of understated humor that you find there. <laughs> puts a gloom on things and casts a dark shadow over the event. Another scene is where a man has his leg severed and it's bleeding there. And, um, one guy asks him how he's doing, and he says, oh, it stings a bit. <laughs> British understatement. <laughs> it's uh, a characteristic of British humor. And uh, I, I find that uh, the, there are many ways in which this kind of understatement occurs in the course of life, not only in humor, but in other ways, and other sometimes matter-of-fact statements that uh, I think on the surface of things, you might be reading along and say, yes, okay, uh -huh, I got it. But then all of a sudden there's something that's said there that's so remarkable, so amazing, that you really ought to stop for a moment and say, could you repeat that? One of those instances occurs in the Gospel accounts where the uh, disciples of John the Baptist are sent by John on a mission to Jesus, and they ask him, are you the Christ? Or should we be looking for someone else? John's in prison at the time. He's not seeing the kinds of things that he was expecting with regard to Jesus as the Christ. Uh, he's not seeing the end of times and the judgment to come and the wicked being driven out of the kingdom of God. And so he's wondering, who are you? And uh, you, you can sense that the, the questions going on in his mind and as Jesus receives these men, he talks to the, the crowd around them, and he says uh, to them about John, he, he's one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, the greatest of, of them all, but he, he really is uh, within that old covenant mindset still. Jesus says that he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. Well, can you imagine that? That in itself is a rather amazing statement, but even more amazing is what Jesus said to the disciples of John, and says, go back and tell John of the things that you see. The blind have their eyes opened, the deaf hear, the lame walk, uh, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Wait, pull the tape back again? You said the dead are raised? The dead are raised? It's amazing enough, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, that Jesus performed all kinds of miracles, astounding miracles, as are recorded here. The blind seeing, the lame walking, the deaf hearing, all the rest of it. Demons cast out, all kinds of amazing, powerful things. But, this surely tops them all. The dead are being raised. And it would seem to me that we should pay a little bit careful note of that. We're aware of several stories in the Gospel accounts of Jesus actually raising the dead. Um, we have the stories of the, the widow at Nain, you recall. She, with a large crowd, is walking out of the city uh, in, in a, a funeral procession. And her only son was on the buyer on the way to be uh, buried. And as this crowd comes out of the city, 
Jesus himself with his own crowd of disciples, a large crowd, comes and meets. And so you've got these two crowds of people coming together with the two principals at the head, the widow with her only son. And of course, in the widow's condition, she doesn't have a husband to care for her. She doesn't have a son to take care of her. So this was a very, very traumatic event in this woman's life. And she's weeping as they're going along. And Jesus comes up to her and says to her, Weep no more. He puts his hand on the funeral fire and he says, Rise up. And the young man sits up and gets up and presents himself alive to everyone there. Amazing. The next chapter, you can see this in the Gospel of Luke. The next chapter, I believe the widow's story is in the seventh chapter, then in the eighth chapter, Jesus is uh, preaching and he gets this message from Jairus, who's a ruler in the synagogue. He comes running up to him and says, my daughter is ill, close to death. Would you please come and help her? And so Jesus gets up right away and goes with Jairus to uh, where his daughter's at. But before they can arrive, and there's a number of things that occur along the way, but before they arrive, word comes that the daughter has died. She's 12 years old. It's his only child. And that must have been devastating news. And the thought was, well, we don't need you anymore, Master. You can return on your way. She's already gone. But Jesus comes and goes to the home, sees everybody mourning, and, you know, in the ancient East, there's that custom of weeping and wailing and loud noises and all the rest of it. And Jesus calms everybody down, sends them out, and says, she's not dead, she's just asleep. And the people laugh at him. But he goes in and he raises the daughter, Talita Kumi. I say to you, rise. And she's risen from the dead. And then we have that account of Lazarus, of course, where Jesus comes to the gravesite of his friend who's been dead for four days. And I believe it's Mary who says to him, that when Jesus said, roll the stone away, Mary says to him, but don't you know there's going to be an odor about it? Four days, corruption has set in. Do you really want the body brought out? And he tells her, did I not tell you, if you only trust me and believe, see great things. Stones opened. And bear in mind, Jesus knows that he himself will be risen from the dead. In a similar situation where the stone needs to be rolled away from the grave, and he will, by his own power, walk out of that tomb. And now he calls forth Lazarus. And Lazarus comes out still wrapped in the great cloths and the mask over his head. He stands before everyone, and Jesus says, take off those grave clothes. And he presents him alive. Jesus raised the dead. Now we have those accounts, but it seems that what Jesus told the disciples of John is that probably there were quite a number of other events where Jesus also raised the dead as well. And so the power of the resurrection was at work in the arrival of the kingdom of God here in this ministry of Christ. The Christ has come, the king has arrived, and the great powers of the eternal age have broken into the temporal period of time. The kingdom that was to come is now here. And Jesus is in the vanguard of that kingdom, performing these wonderful signs, indicating that he is in fact the king. He is, as Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The resurrection has its source in Jesus Christ. Now, one, one final account, which is also curious that we read a moment ago, is that when Jesus died at the cross, you recall that Matthew tells how there was this great earthquake and the, the tombs of the dead, of the saints, were opened up and the bodies came out. Now, not quite sure exactly what's being said here. It, it, they came out of the death of Christ and the bodies came up. Were they just laying there on the surface, dead like that? Or did they rise up alive? At any rate, Matthew says that when Jesus was risen, they stood up and they walked out and they showed themselves alive to many. As it were, the first fruits of the resurrection. 
So you have the great power of God at work in Jesus. He is surrounded by resurrections all around him, signifying that he is the resurrection and the life. And then we have the account as well of his own resurrection. And so we come to what Peter has to say in Acts chapter 2, where uh, about 40, 50 days after the resurrection of Christ and after his ascension into heaven, Jesus, or excuse me, Peter is there with this great, great crowd of folks wondering about what all this can be, people speaking in their own tongues, a wide variety of tongues, and Peter explains. And at the point of it, at the heart of it, is this message about Jesus Christ. You've crucified the Prince of Life, putting him to death. Now that's kind of a mind-boggling state that you put to death the Prince of Life. But it was all by the determined plan of God, by his purpose, that a wicked men would put Jesus to death. But on the third day, as Peter says, we are all witnesses. We here are witnesses to the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. Now you can go to the gospel accounts, of course, and examine that for yourself. But Peter says, we are all witnesses. We observed it. It's just like what Jesus said to the disciples of John. Tell John what you see and hear. I should note that so I wanted to comment a moment ago. Think of John for just a moment. John the Baptist, I'm sorry for zipping back here for a moment, but John the Baptist having doubts, questions about Jesus, and wondering, is he really who we should expect? Is it not the case that at times there are those kinds of feelings that come into our hearts and minds as well? We look at our experiences of life, uh, troubles with our health, our finances, our job, what have you, uh, things going on in the contemporary world, and we wonder, how does this fit in with the promises of God? How does this fit in with the fact that I'm redeemed? Why are not things going more smoothly? Why is there struggles with sin the way that I've got to deal with? And so sometimes we may be tempted to doubt the question, and the remedy for that is in part to have a fresh look at Jesus and what he's actually doing in the world. We tend to think of the world, look at the world, and see all the evils and the problems and the troubles and get overwhelmed by that. But we don't see often enough what Jesus himself is actually doing in the world and rejoice in that. I read an article this week uh, from the Federalist, not perhaps the, the most obvious source of Christian information, uh, but I would say that it was an article that talked about the, the growth of the Christian church within our country. And the, the typical uh, view is that the church is in great decline, people are leaving the churches, the attendance at church is down, and all these kinds of things are happening. But a more detailed analysis of, of, of these things showed that, quite to the contrary, while mainline churches with really their different religious beliefs, their different religion, their unbelief in terms of the, the, the truth of the gospel and the work of Christ and these kinds of things. People are leaving those churches in droves, yes. They are continuing to decline. Mainline churches, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, Lutheran, and so forth, they're in decline. But more conservative churches, those who believe that the Bible is true, that Christ indeed rose from the dead in his real body and he brings us salvation from sin and death, those churches are continuing to grow. In fact, they made an interesting note that church attendance today is greater than it has been ever before. When you consider particularly a lot of the non-denominational churches and the small groups and all these kinds of things, church attendance is much greater than ever before as a percentage of the population. That might surprise us when we think of the early American days and we think that was the heyday of Christian influence in our nation and we've been decaying ever since then. But actually, we've been growing. So sometimes what we need to do is have a fresh view of Jesus and what he's doing in our world today and rejoice in that. And it's many ways of, of being manifest. John needed a fresh view of Jesus and his work. The dead are raised. He was one who raised the dead. And he himself would come to life on the third day. Now Peter 
wants to verify the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead. There's his own testimony, the testimony of the disciples there who observed it, who've been speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit. They testify to the resurrection of Jesus. But, Je but Peter me, goes on to say that you also have the testimony of the scriptures themselves. This is what David anticipated long ago, and he brings us back to Psalm 16, where David has his vision of the Lord standing before him, who rejoiced that he would not suffer decay, but would ascend into heaven. And Peter says, if you look at what David has to say, it's very evident that he's not speaking of himself, because there are certain historical facts that we can use to interpret what Peter said. The fact of the matter is that David's tomb is with us today. We can see where he died, where he was buried. His body's right there. It's a little bit south there of the old city of Jerusalem. Peter says you can go to that body today. But David, being a prophet, spoke of the Christ, his son, who would also be his Lord. And that one would not suffer decay but enter into the very presence of the Lord. And so Peter used Psalm 16 as evidence that the Old Testament foretells the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through David, who speaks of his descendant, who would not suffer decay or see corruption, but would rather enter into life. And so, so the scriptures themselves affirm that this is what we are to expect of the Messiah. Jesus is that Messiah, Peter is saying. You can match these events to the life of Jesus, and we are just 50 days out from the resurrection of Jesus, so if there's any question about it, try to find his tomb and see where the body's at. You'll find an empty tomb. And no one can point to that physical body here. He rose. He has ascended into heaven. And so Peter verifies the resurrection of Christ in these ways. The, the testimony of Old Testament Scripture, the evidence of the outpouring of the Spirit that also is in fulfillment of the resurrection of Christ. He uh, quotes from Psalm 110, where God promises that he will set him on his throne at his right hand and uh, make his enemies a footstool for his feet. He pour his spirit upon him. And Jesus takes that spirit at Pentecost and pours it out upon the church. So the presence of the spirit upon the church is evidence of the resurrection of Christ as well. Now, what I want to bring to your attention here in, in these series of messages, I've been trying to capture different topics along the way, different points along the way in terms of church in terms of the gospel itself, that we can use to witness to neighbors and friends. We are called to be witnesses. G Peter says we are all witnesses, and he's speaking of those who are there, but we too join in that witness. And that we too can testify to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We do not see it personally, but we have the testimony that we've received in Scripture, and what is more, we have the testimony of the, the resurrection that has occurred within our own hearts. You know, as we read from Ephesians chapter 2, and you can also see in Romans chapter 6, uh, the Apostle Paul speaks of the facts of the gospel of Christ and how we are united to Christ. And our union with Christ is not really a union with him and his work, or a union with him and his life, or what have you, but it's a union specifically in both his death and in his resurrection. And this central fact of the gospel is what we are connected with. That's what brings us life. And so Paul says our old nature, our sinful nature has been crucified with Christ, is done away with. And we are set free. We are now risen with Christ. And so we have a new principle of life at work within us so that we are now able to live for God. And so the great change that has occurred in our lives, the new life that is within us, is evidence of the fact that Christ is indeed risen from the dead because he has unleashed the powers of the age to come. He has set those powers at work in our lives as well. Remember the writing to the Hebrews in chapter 6 speaks of those who have tasted of the 
the, the goodness of the Lord and the powers of the age to come. That great eschaton has worked itself out into this world. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, or 5 that when we come to Christ, there is a new creation. Old things have passed away, but all has become new. So this great end times uh, resurrection has already made its influence felt today. Jesus in John chapter 5, the text that we kind of skimmed over last week, but in the course of that, this conversation about uh, the witnesses who testified to Christ, his miraculous works and so forth, goes on to talk about how he will uh, raise the dead. And even now, the dead are being raised. That is to say that those who believe in him experience new life and come to enjoy that great power of the resurrection that is yet to come in its fullness. And so we are witnesses of the resurrection by virtue of the transformation of our lives and the new life that is at work within us. And so we may bear witness to that great work of Christ. And so whether it be the, the, the virgin birth of Christ, the miracles of Christ, the death of Christ on the cross, his resurrection, these are all different points that we can go to somebody and say, hey, listen, have you considered the miracles that Jesus performed? What do you make of the fact that he walked on the water? Or the testimonies of these things? Do you know the abundance of miracles that he performed and the many witnesses that were there for them? Do you know about the resurrection? How Jesus performed, raised many people from the dead. There were many witnesses. You have the crowd of name from the city seeing Jesus raise them. And the crowd that was with Jesus as well saw him raise this man. You have the crowd that was assembled at the tomb of Lazarus. Seeing him and afterwards following after Jesus as they go to uh, the, the city of Jerusalem and all the, the Pharisees and so forth wondering that, that the whole world's going to follow after him because of these things. There were many, many witnesses to the fact that Jesus is the Christ and that through him there is salvation and everlasting life. And all these many things provide us points of conversation with our neighbors and friends so that we can be witnesses to Christ. The resurrection is one more witness to that great work. And so we see the powers at work of the age to come, and then finally I'll make this point, that the resurrection of Christ uh, declares the completion of God's work of salvation, and indeed his own justification. Now let me explain that in just a little bit. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, um, you'll see there that the Apostle Paul makes use of a, a little bit of a hymn composed of uh, three couplets. Um, he was manifested in the flesh, was in, in some translations vindicated by the Spirit, or justified, or literally justified by the Spirit, uh, laid on in the world, uh, taken up into glory, I think, and, and it goes on. And so you have the, these three couplets. And if you want to read more about this, uh, see Dr. Richard Gaffin's book, uh, which in my day at seminary was called The Centrality of the Resurrection. Today I think it's under a different title. But uh, he, he makes the point that in this text you have these uh, contrasts in each of these couplets. In the first contrast you have the contrast between flesh and spirit, manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. And some take a look at that uh, contrast there and say, well, this speaks to his human nature on the one hand, the flesh, and his divine nature, the spirit. And while Jesus is fully man and fully God, I, I think, along with Dr. Gaffin, it may be more useful to see this as a contrast uh, in developing uh, the states of humiliation and exaltation for Christ. It's a redemptive historical view of his progress from humiliation in the flesh to exaltation in the spirit. And his resurrection and the new powers of the heavens and the earth and his receiving the spirit of God. And this justification of Jesus or vindication is in virtue of the fact that he was our sin bearer when he went to that cross. He bore the wrath of God for our sins. And his resurrection, as Paul says in Romans chapter 4, is, was for our justification. In other words, when Jesus rose from the dead, it, it was a, a sign that 
uh, God accepted his sacrifice for us, that the full penalty of sin was paid, and that death could no longer keep its prey. Jesus would be raised. Our justification was accomplished, but it was also the justification of Jesus because he was the sinless Son of God, and now he is declared righteous. It's that declarative, forensic nature of justification. It's not that he's made righteous because he was personally righteous through and through, but he's declared righteous before a watching world by his resurrection from the dead. And so as we are joined to Jesus Christ in his resurrection, he declares that we are justified. We are righteous in the sight of God. And so the resurrection unleashes the powers of the age to come into this world. They even anticipate the judgment of all things at the end. And so we can uh, go from the present to the future in that respect and say that the, the presence of the powers of the age to come point to the great judgment yet to come when we will all be raised from the dead and stand before God and give an account for our lives. But then further, we have the, the uh, sure affirmation that we have been justified before God. Our sins have been forgiven. We are declared righteous in Christ with whom we are united. Christ is righteous and we are in him so we are righteous too. He is the second Adam, and we are in him. And so as he is justified, we are justified in him. And so have you considered the resurrection? How it brings in the, the powers of the, of the new age to come, and how it also declares our justification from sin, our right standing before God. If we appreciate these things as those who are the redeemed of the Lord, should we not speak of these things, not in an understated manner, oh, by the way, did you hear that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, yeah. But rather, tell everyone, He's risen, and I am risen too, and you also may come to new life through His great power. He has worked justification. He has produced justification. And all who are joined to him through faith are declared righteous. Would you not call upon him today who is in heaven now and ask him to forgive your sins and to justify you, declare you righteous in him? We should be overstated in our testimony to this resurrected Lord and to all that he has accomplished. David said in Psalm 16 that he rejoiced and his soul was filled with joy at the thought of the resurrection and this presence in, with the Lord in heaven. And so should we. Well, I'm going to finish here. I have more in the sermon with regard to Karl Barth and all the nonsense that he teaches, but that's a little bit beyond what I think what we need to hear this morning. So we'll finish up here this morning, and uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the resurrection of Christ and the things that we can learn from that. We pray that your spirit would bless us with uh, hearts that are filled with joy over what you've accomplished. Uh, in all the many ways in which you've revealed yourself and your purposes in Jesus Christ and his a unique and marvelous birth as born of a virgin in his sinless life and the powerful works and miracles, signs and wonders that he did that uh, signify that he is the Christ who's come to save us. In the uh, death of Christ, whereby he uh, accomplished our uh, redemption and brought to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification. Lord, we just pray that your gospel message would be the a message of our hearts and our minds and on our tongues as our lives are transformed and we are resurrected souls, saints going about the earth proclaiming the resurrection. We pray that you would fill us with joy in knowing that we are raised and that others too may, might be raised to new life. We ask your blessing on uh, the work of the gospel in this place in our lives and our testimony to our family and friends and neighbors and workmates as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's respond to the ministry of the Word of God by bringing before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings. Uh, 
evils and the darkness of this world, and even the, the evils that are within our own flesh. Help us, O oh Lord, to uh, trust in you and to walk by the Spirit. We pray that you would uh, strengthen us in this way, that we might be a light to our uh, neighborhood, and that your name would be glorified in us. We thank you for uh, First Church and for the way that you provided for it over the years, and pray for your continued blessing on its ministry. We thank you for those who have taught in our Sunday school and who continue to teach and pray for your blessing on them. We pray too for, or we thank you as well for those who have served in a variety of capacities in the life of the church, uh, in providing meals and also in um, care, providing for the, the property here and helping out in a wide variety of ways. Lord, we just pray for your blessing on each one. We thank you for the gifts that you've given to your church here and pray that you would be glorified in them. We pray, Lord, that you would uh, bless the work of the church overseas. We think of uh, those who are in Uganda. We thank you for uh, the opportunity that uh, our mission work there has had to uh, speak with uh, uh, tribal elders and others of, of influence in that uh, realm. And we thank you that they have been listening closely to what they've had to say. And we pray, Lord, for your blessing on them. We pray that you would uh, bless the church that gathers there. Pray that your spirit would open the gospel to their hearts and minds, that they would receive the work of Christ for themselves. Father, we think of our missionaries in China. We pray that your spirit would be at work in their lives. We pray that you provide for them as they seek to uh, establish uh, a presbytery and ordain men for ministry and train others as well. We pray for your blessing on those efforts. Be with those who are uh, moving into China at this time, uh, making arrangements to arrive. We pray for safety in their travels, and we pray that you would help them to get set up and started in their work, and we pray for your blessing on each one. Father, we thank you for uh, the many ways in which your gospel is advancing, not only in the missions of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, but, but in many other efforts as well. And we pray for those who, uh, with whom we have had contact with. Lord, we just pray that you would uh, watch over these who have committed themselves to your care and uh, bear witness to Christ. We pray for those who are in the Middle East and uh, ministering to refugee uh, populations in Syria, Christians who are under attack. We pray that you protect them and give them help at this time. Deliver them from evil, from harm. We pray for your blessing on your church there. As many believers have suffered tremendously for their faith uh, throughout that region, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to take soberly our commitments to follow you and help us to be mindful of their sufferings and to do what we can to alleviate, alleviate their suffering through uh, many different ways. Father, I pray for uh, a friend of mine in India, a pastor who works with other pastors to bring the gospel into remote portions of India. We thank you for the church there. and for We thank you for uh, our country. We pray for your blessing on our president as he will address the nation and on Tuesday night. We pray that you give him wisdom and what he has to say. Give him, if it be your will, a favorable hearing. We pray, Lord, that you would prosper our nation, defend us from evil, help us to overcome the wicked. Help us, O oh Lord, to advance the cause of righteousness, truth, and love. We thank you for your mercies to us and pray for your blessing on our congregation as well. We would continue to consider those who are ill. We pray for Carol Menick that you would bring strength to her legs and help her to be able to walk again with confidence. Uh, we pray for Rhoda. We thank you for a measure of healing in her life and pray that you continue to watch over her, uh, protect her from further bouts of inflammation. And we pray, Lord, for your provision for her. Uh, Father, we pray for uh, John Baldwin as he continues to uh, recover from his concussion. We pray that you bring uh, continued uh, uh, healing and help to him. And bless him in his work and provide for his family as well. We thank you, Lord, for uh, others in our midst. We pray for Linda. We pray that you would give her strength as she uh, has come down with the cold. We pray that you would help her to... Uh, be restored to health again, be with Jack as he takes care of her, and bless him and the family there. Father, I pray for Brian, that you would help him to find work and provide him with an opportunity to serve others, and we pray for your blessing on him and your provision for his needs. 
We thank you for your care for George and Ella McLaren. We pray that you continue to watch over them in their home, uh, give them safety in their travels, and we pray for your blessing on their hearts that they would look to you in faith and rest in you for all good things. We thank you for your kindness to us. We pray for uh, each one here. We pray that your blessing would be on us all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.